Hello and welcome to our first video introducing anatomy and physiology. If you are watching this, my guess is that you are a student who just started taking an anatomy and physiology course, or you are someone who is interested in learning about how the body works. Either way, we got you covered. In this video and throughout this video series, we will explore the ins and outs of the human body and many of its systems that work together and help you do, well, everything including watching this video. So let's get started. When you first begin to learn about anatomy and physiology, it helps to break down these two terms separately to understand the scope of the content that you will cover. Anatomy, by definition, refers to the study and understanding of structures. As this course has a biological human focus, I am sure you can piece together that you will be learning about the structures of the human body. And yes, there are many. But what good are structures if you don't know how they function? That's where physiology comes in. Physiology, by definition, in our human biological sense, is referring to an understanding of how the structures of the body work and seeks to uncover the mechanisms by which they operate. In many textbooks and in many other videos, you will often see these ideas summarized under the larger concept of form fits function. To make the equivalency here, anatomy refers to form and physiology refers to function. The great thing about this concept is that it often helps us explore a more difficult question to answer in this realm, which is the question of why. Why is the esophagus made up of longitudinal smooth muscle? Well, if that's how the form is set up, it probably has something to do with its function. Those longitudinal muscles move in a peristaltic wave-like motion to force food in one direction toward the stomach. That's why. Easy, right? When studying anatomy and physiology, we can also look at both form and function from different scales. The study of gross anatomy focuses on larger structures, like the brain as a whole, for example, which can also be broken down into a few other regions, where microscopic anatomy focuses on the smaller structures, like the neurons within the brain. Both viewpoints help us understand form and function in essential ways. Classifying structures in the body to be small or large is helpful, but anatomists have another way to categorize these ideas into what we call levels of organization. These levels help put both structure and function into context and provide a means for studying and explaining what we see happening in the body. Starting from the smallest and moving to the largest, the levels include the chemical level, cellular level, tissue level, organ level, organ system level, and organism level. You can see here that each level builds on itself to create the next larger category. So we can look at and study an individual cell, but if we were to view many of the same cells working together in the same part of the body, we can call that a tissue, and so on. Keep these levels of organization in mind as you continue to learn about anatomy and physiology. We will talk about each one in more detail throughout the rest of the course. At this point, you should be starting to see the vast complexity that the human body possesses. All of the smaller levels of organization show us the pieces that add up to the greater systems of the body. If you have taken a health class or have learned a little about the human body, many of these systems are probably familiar to you. But to make sure we have a base level of identification for each one, Let's go ahead and name the main systems found within the body, many of which we will cover throughout this course. From top to bottom and left to right, we have the integumentary system, the skeletal system, lymphatic system, respiratory system, muscular system, nervous system, digestive system, urinary system, endocrine system, cardiovascular system, and the male and female reproductive systems. All of these systems work together to complete the actions necessary to sustain the workings of the body and keep us alive. For now, take a look at the images and read the bullet points to get an idea of the structures and functions of each one. Studying human anatomy and physiology means studying the processes in the body that help build, maintain, and sustain life. 
When we look at the human as a living organism, and many other species of animals for that matter, we can find certain functions emerge that are needed for life to be achieved and maintained. Look at different websites and in different textbooks and this list of functions will differ slightly though the same basic ideas apply. The functions that we will focus on for human life in this class are organization, movement, responsiveness, digestion, metabolism, excretion, reproduction, and growth. The anatomical structures and physiological functions of the body work to help or maintain these functions. Let's take a moment to explore one of these requirements in detail before we move on. The image on the slide shows how structures in the body carry out metabolic processes to help maintain life. We all need energy to live, and the runners in this image seem to be using up more energy than those of you watching this video at this very moment in time. In order for them to continue to run a long distance, they will need to continue to use more energy which means the body will need to have more energy available for use. Metabolic activity in their cells breaks down food molecules like sugars that can be used to make cellular energy to keep them going through a process called cellular respiration. This process is essential as cellular energy is used for many actions that take place in all cells, tissues, and organs. Applying these functions of life to all other concepts you learn in this course will help you gain a deeper understanding of what human life, and life in general, is all about. Understanding the functions of human life are important because they describe how the anatomy and physiology of the body work. But aside from those functions, there are a few other external requirements needed for our bodies to function properly. Humans cannot survive for more than a few days without consuming water, and not more than a few minutes without oxygen. These two molecules are important for many functions in the body and must be taken in from our environment. Staying on that smaller scale, we can see the many other electrolytes and molecules that we need like carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, vitamins, and minerals. These components play an important role in maintaining cell health and function and allow for different tissues and systems in the body to work together. A few other important external factors to consider are heat and pressure. Our bodies are designed to maintain a specific internal temperature, and deviating from that could cause problems. But we know that humans live in different biomes all over the world, so we can assume that everybody still has a way to manage and maintain their temperature, no matter if you are living in a hot and dry desert, or a cold and snowy forest. Lastly, our bodies are designed to be able to withstand a specific range of atmospheric pressure, allowing us to properly carry out respiration. Quick and or drastic changes in atmospheric pressure could greatly impact one's ability to perform these functions. So far we have talked a lot about how the body maintains balance to survive. So let's dive a bit deeper into that idea and give the concept a name. Homeostasis is a process that describes how the body works to maintain specific internal balances that support the healthy functioning of its components. So we can say that if something gets out of balance, then our body often has a process it can use to bring it back. Or as we will see on the next slide, purposefully continue that action until a threshold is met. An easy example to consider is temperature change. If our body temperature goes above a certain threshold, there is a homeostatic pathway that activates to attempt to correct it. It starts with the change in temperature regulators sending signals to our brain. When this signal is received and the body is interpreted to be too warm, another signal gets sent from the brain telling the sweat glands to produce and secrete a sweat solution. Once forced onto the exterior layer of the skin, the solution can then evaporate, which helps to cool the body down. When the desired temperature is reached, this process will stop. The idea of homeostasis working in a loop is really important, so let's explore a few more loops on the next slide. There are two main types of feedback loops that we will cover in this course, and they are positive and negative. A negative feedback loop, as shown in the image on the left, describes a mechanism that works primarily to keep something level or within a threshold. Blood sugar, 
i.e. the amount of dissolved sugar molecules floating around in your bloodstream, is an example of something that needs to be maintained at a specific level, as having too much or too little sugar in your blood can be harmful. So, you need a balanced amount in your blood to keep things working efficiently, not too much, not too little. Your body does this by maintaining a negative feedback loop with two hormones called insulin and glucagon. If your blood sugar drops too low, glucagon is secreted from the pancreas which tells your liver and muscles to break apart stored sugar molecules and release them into the bloodstream, thereby raising your blood sugar. On the flip side, if your blood sugar is too high, the hormone insulin is secreted from the pancreas which signals cells to take in sugar and store it for later use, thereby decreasing the amount of sugar in the blood. Again, balance is the key to negative feedback. But we also have positive feedback, which is much different. In positive feedback, the body is not concerned about maintaining balance, but rather continuing to change something until a final action takes place. This could mean increasing hormones or decreasing hormones until a change is made. Our example here for positive feedback is that of human labor and delivery of a child, shown in the image on the right. During this process, when a mother is ready to give birth, she has contractions. During contractions, the baby is pushed toward the cervix. When pressure is applied to the cervix, a signal is sent to the brain that tells the pituitary gland to secrete oxytocin. Oxytocin then stimulates more contractions, and more contractions means more pressure on the cervix and more oxytocin being made. You can see where we're going with this, as contractions and oxytocin production both continue to increase up until the baby is born. This then completes the positive feedback loop, and the oxytocin secretion and contractions will stop. Understanding the general behaviors of positive and negative feedback loops will allow you to better understand many other physiological mechanisms that occur within the human body. When learning anatomy, at times it can seem like you are learning another language. This is normal, and for a good reason. There are so many intricate parts of the human body that when you try to describe something, simply saying the structure next to something or to the left of something just doesn't cut it. Anatomists use specific terminology when describing the body to increase precision and help communicate effectively. We will not cover all of these terms you need to know in this video, but go ahead and pause here and review some of the terms that relate to body location and direction we will use many of these terms throughout the course. Body planes are other important terms that anatomists use to reference locations and cuts. The frontal plane cuts the body into front and back halves and helps describe side-to-side -side movements. The transverse plane cuts the body into top and bottom halves and helps describe twisting movements. And finally, the sagittal plane cuts the body into left and right halves and helps describe forward and backward movements. You will also hear these terms throughout this course in reference to movements and body imaging. Just as we can split the body into planes, we can also section off parts of the body into cavities, regions, and quadrants. The dorsal body cavity, seen in an orangish-red color, comprises the brain and spinal cord which sit in the cranial and vertebral cavities. We have the thoracic cavity made up of the purple, orange, and blue sections, the abdominal cavity in red, and the pelvic cavity here in green. All of those together make up the larger ventral body cavity. As seen here, we can break up the abdominal cavity into regions and quadrants. From right to left and top to bottom, we have the right hypochondriac region, epigastric region, left hypochondriac region, right lumbar region, umbilical region, left lumbar region, right iliac region, hypogastric region, and the left iliac region. We can also divide these abdominal cavities into more general quadrants as seen here. Right upper, left upper, right lower, and left lower quadrants. When we divide sections of the body into the larger regions I mentioned before, it is usually because an anatomically placed separation already exists. 
Take the serous membrane around the heart as an example. In the same way that you could wrap a deflated balloon around your fist, the heart is enclosed in a membrane that helps separate it from other structures around it. It allows the heart to function separately and maintain gradients that allow it to function properly. This particular serous membrane around the heart is called the pericardium, and we can see other similar membranes around the lungs, called the pleura, and around the abdominal cavity, called the peritoneum. Each serous structure protects and helps maintain balance around the organs it covers and can be broken down into parts. The inner layer of the membrane that touches the organ is called the visceral serosa. The middle section is called the cavity, and the outer membrane is called the parietal serosa. Apply these terms to the serous membrane around the heart, and you get the visceral pericardium, the pericardial cavity, and the parietal pericardium. Reviewing, understanding, and practicing all of these terms is important for your overall understanding of anatomy and physiology.